Hello! Welcome to Why Not Both, the podcast all about how our multiple passions and interests shape our identity and our lives. My name is Pam Schaefer, and I am a musician and therapist in Los Angeles, and I also happen to be your host. This podcast is produced by Laura Studeris, and for this season, we've partnered up with Under the Radar magazine. If you like what you hear, you can hang out with us on social media. We are on Twitter and Instagram at WNB, the podcast. And if you really, really like what you hear, please support us on Patreon. We are under Why Not Both podcast. When you join our Patreon, you get a whole bunch of really cool behind the scenes stuff and you get to chat with us. And that's pretty awesome. Thank you so much for your support. And I hope you enjoy our interviews. For this week's episode, we were joined by the talented and wise Jensen McRae. I hope that you enjoy our interview. Welcome to Why Not Both, where uh, things are chaotic, as usual. (laughs) (laughs) What would life be without a little bit of chaos? (laughs) So in in the prior times, I would chat with people about the multiple things that they did, which was the conceit of the podcast. And now the conceit of the podcast is like, hey, how are you? (laughs) How's it going? (laughs) You know, it's... um... It's it's going. It's a busy, busy time. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited about like everything that's going on, but it's just weird because it's coinciding with, you know, a lot of still continuing chaos in the quote unquote real world. And, you know, just trying to balance like excitement about career things with like difficulties of life things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's always strange when you... <sighs> There should be a word for it. I'm sure that there must be like in German or something about like the guilt that you feel for the gratitude of things going well when other things are going poorly. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure the Germans, if anyone was going to have a word, it would be them. They know how to combine a lot of feelings together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like guiltitude, guilt <laughs> Guiltitude. Guiltitude <laughs> is great. I really like that. I'm going to put that in my in my reservoir. <laughs> yes, guiltitude. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's a relatable feeling. Like it's almost like when something goes well, I look kind of like to you know each side as though I'm crossing the road, being like, "Is it real? Did the good thing really happen? Is it here?" (laughs) I guess what's been what are the good things that have been going on like career wise? Like, I mean, I've been following along, but I'm like, (laughs) tell the humans listening to the podcast. Well, 2021, just in general, was very positive for my career. I started the year off by accidentally going viral on Twitter with my Phoebe Bridgers parody that became my song Immune. Um, And that kind of ended up being like a gateway to a lot of other really great opportunities, Um, as well as some other things that like the seeds had kind of been planted for in 2020. Like I did a collab with um, the ex-ambassadors and with Joy Alatacoon, and both of those came out at the beginning of 2021. So there was like a lot of really cool things that came from that. And then recently, um, I've, I've started working actually on my second album. My first album isn't out yet. Um, but I've started working on my second album in preparation for putting out my first album pretty soon. I don't know when this episode will be up, so I don't know if I will have like announced <laughs> <laughs> all of the logistics of that, but like an album is coming. I think like everybody knows that much. Um, excellent. So since that is on the way, we're, we're trying to get ahead of the curve and we're, we're in the process of making, the second one uh, in this, I'm in a bit of a kind of a limbo right now because I'm going on tour in April. So like kind of between now and then is oh, wow. me making the second album, getting ready to, you know, do all of the stuff that's required for the rollout of the first one. Um, and yeah, basically the whole first half of the year is just like a lot of like very consistent, exciting things. Um, wow. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to all of it. Oh my gosh. And also working on my brain just went to like so many different places. But like, <laughs> I'm like working on the second album while rolling out the first album. I'm like, 
Oh my gosh. Cause then the, it's almost like living in like two different worlds. <laughs> like, it really is, Especially because, so I have a production deal with my amazing producer, Rocky. So he and I, everything that I put out, that's my solo stuff I do with him. And we made the first album when I was a senior in college, which now is, I graduated like three years ago, which is really mm-hmm. nice to say. So like that album is three years old and like all that music I'm really, really proud of still. I still feel like somewhat connected to it because I mean, I made it Mm -hmm. (laughs) at the same time. Like I'm so much older and I've experienced so much stuff since then. Right. um, That's been uh, really, really interesting to like kind of frame that old album, like through the lens of my current self. Like I didn't expect that 21 would seem like such a distant memory, but it really, really does. Uh, at 24 I feel like such a I feel like that's very natural I guess for your 20s like every year you feel like you're like the the growth is very steep and then my yes. is that I guess it levels off a little bit I want to grow and change for the rest of my life but hopefully not at such a steep <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been enough it's an, to quote one of my favorite TikTok audios it's enough slices yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I heard in my head I was like that's enough that's enough <laughs> <laughs> is it like I mean I, I know that's true for everybody but it's like I I've experienced not only like my skill increases really rapidly in a way that I don't think will sustain forever like I don't think I'm gonna look at songs when I'm 32 I don't think I'm gonna look at songs I wrote at 31 and go whoa I'm that's a totally different person but I definitely right. year over year now am having that feeling both about my skill but also just about like who I am and like the things that I'm capable of and it's like pretty much all for the better but the yeah the experience of looking at my old music and now being in the process of like I mean playing it for at least the next year live when I've been thinking about it for the previous three is really yeah. exciting because I've been wanting to put it out but it's also interesting like I'm gonna be this like wry wise narrator narrating my own story which is- <laughs> well and uh, I was just like as an elder millennial <laughs> um, <laughs> um It's interesting because yeah, like you do, you do still change every year, but the rate of change does slow down a bit, but also like, there's been like a lot of spicy things that have happened in the last few years that like, (laughs) that also kind of skew the data on that a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Like I definitely, I look back at songs that I wrote and have had that experience that's what I was thinking about when you said you were working on your second album well well you know about to tour your first one and I've sometimes had the feeling where I'll look back at like kind of like you know baby me and be like oh I totally understand like why I felt that way then and why I wrote that thing then and like that makes total sense then but it's almost like a little time capsule and it's not that I don't relate to it I just happen to like not be there anymore yeah and so like, I, yeah, it's a weird experience where like, there's very few things that I've made that I'm like, well, that was terrible. And I'm mortified, thankfully. I mean, I'm sure that maybe there there's mortifying things in there. And maybe I just like, you know, am embarrassment proof, but like, it's like, for the most part, I'm like, oh, I see where you were going with that. And, okay. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. And I think like the biggest and best part about growing up is having so much more compassion for my younger self. Like, I think when I was like 18, looking at the things I was thinking at 15, I was like very mean and like, oh my God, I was dumb. I was bad. And now I'm a good genius. <laughs> and, like, I feel like at 24, like I'm much better at looking at 15 and 18 and 21 and thinking like, oh, there's so much I didn't know, but like, I don't have any like anger towards her or like embarrassment towards her. Like, and I think that the older that I get it, the easier it will be to have compassion and like the less critical I'll be of my younger self because like, I've always been a person who struggled with not knowing things. I always used to beat myself up when I was a kid for not knowing everything all the time. I hated questions in school because I thought it proved that I didn't know something. But (laughs) like over time, I've gotten a lot better at asking questions and a lot better at uncertainty. And like just knowing that the growth is coming even if and the growth is happening even when I can't see it. Yes. And just yeah, yeah, I think it's I, I used to like as a bit, like show pictures of my younger self and be like, Oh, I was gross and ugly. And look at how great I am now. But now I'm like, I don't want to call my younger self ugly. That's so mean. I don't want to call her dumb. That's mean. I want to take care of her because she's still with me. Oh, I was just like, I hope that everybody listens to that 
clip over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) I'm really, I really want people to, I think we all deserve to like be just so much gentler on our, especially our past selves. We all need to be more gentler with our, more gentle with our present selves too, but especially our past selves. Cause it's like that person was doing their best with what they had. Yes. Yes. There's always like looking back on my past self, I always think like, okay, I was acting on the knowledge that I had then and like the experience I had then, but I have different knowledge and experience now. And yes, I might've chosen differently now, but I also have like different and more experience. Like, of course I would have chosen something else. Like I know different things now. (laughs) I I always complained to my mom. I'm like, oh man, like I would love to do high school as my current self. I would be so good at high school because I would like be the same person, but it wouldn't bother me. Like I would be so much less insecure. I yes. would have like just kept my head down, just enjoyed my time, made the best of it. I wouldn't have been so antagonistic. <laughs> the fact that I was like not a cool teenager. Like, but you had to be that person to become the person you are now. Like that was a necessary step. Like of course yes. you would be a great high school student at 24. <laughs> 24 year old knowledge. But you were 16. You didn't know anything. And that's fine. That's the point of being 16 is that you don't know. Anything. You don't know stuff. Oh, my God. You could go back to high school, like, undercover style. <laughs> like <laughs> No one believes me when I'm in public. Like, I don't, well, first of all, the problem when I get carded is that my license photo is my 15 year old. <laughs> I'm getting a new license soon. I'm getting my license renewed. So I'm going to get a new photo and it'll be fine. But I, whenever I get carded, people are like, that's not you. And I'm like, yes, it is. And they're like, you're not over 21. I'm like, I swear to God, I am a grown woman. I just have a very round face. Oh, my God. Okay. Get it. <laughs> I'm like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> that is where we're at. It's like, are you, you, like, people assume that I'm a teenager. People ask me what grade I'm in. I'm like, I graduated college three years ago. I'm not in a grade. <laughs> you're like, I'm not in a grade. So low key. I'm like, okay, here's me wearing, like, uh, lip balm. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. We love this for me. I'm turning 40 in seven days. Oh no, there's no chance anyone believes that. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I, I call it now, um, immortal bog witch energy. <laughs> like, <laughs> because I thought throughout my twenties, I was just like, ah, oh, this is so annoying. Everyone thinks I'm a teenager. And then in my thirties, I was like, oh, this is so annoying. Like people still think I'm a teenager. <laughs> like, and now I'm about to enter a new decade. And I'm like, you know, at least people ask me what college I go to. At least now they think I'm in college. Yeah, we're <laughs> like, up in the world. <laughs> like it just, it becomes like for me, and I don't know if this will carry through for you, but it becomes kind of a fun game because it defies people's expectations. Because like they see you as like, this little fluffy bunny person. And like, I have like the round face and like, you know, the, uh, I, my other option of hair, by the way, the one time I tried to cut my hair shorter, it just went outward. Of course. Same. Um, same boat. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, basically Eastern European Jewish hair just, yes, it only I goes outward. <laughs> like, my mom is, my mom is an Eastern European Jew and that is the hair that she gave to me. And it's just not, it's, you gotta, you gotta grow it out if you don't want it going sideways. <laughs> yes. So it's like, wow, how did you choose to have like such long mermaid hair? I'm like, the other choice was not good. The other choice was bad. <laughs> <in a> square. <laughs> yes. And so it's like between the two of those, like, it's just fun because people perceive you in a certain way and then you get to kind of play with those expectations. <laughs> I mean, obviously like our, our culture for, for better or for worse, mainly for worse, like really overvalues youth. Um, and I think like on the one hand, obviously, yes, like it's frustrating to have people, I feel like maybe take me less seriously when they assume that I'm younger, but on the other hand, like, you know, in the, in a, in a society that values youth, like I will have access to a little bit more of that currency. And I know that like, as I age, like, it's very easy for me to talk about like, oh, I'm excited to age because I like don't actually know what that's going to entail. Like, it's possible that like the signs of aging that I bear will look different for other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm like, but because I've always felt like my appearance was like a less important part of who I was, like whether I remain looking exactly like this or whether I like rapidly start aging at some point, like I'm just like not super concerned right? Um, because I feel like being, being that weird teenager in high school and like being outcast, like it prepares you for any possible future where like you cannot, you can no longer use your looks as any form of currency. Bingo. Like it gives you, 
it's almost like this weird audacity where like, since you had to develop a personality, yeah. like you continue having one. Yeah, <laughs> like, my, jokes, my joke when I was for, well, I guess it's still my, my bit now, but it's like, there's like people who were pretty there, people who become attractive as they enter adulthood. And then people who are attractive their whole life and the people who are attractive for their whole life never had to learn a trade. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think if you, if you have any peer, if you have any awkward phase, like that was the time when you learned your trade. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or you're like, let me squirrel away and hide in a tree and figure out how to do something in the world that people will maybe value me for because in the meantime I'm hiding in a hoodie <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's great because like like I said like I have so much more compassion for my younger self now and I also have so much more compassion for my present self like I'm really working on like taking the pressure off one like caring about what I look like because I spent so much time cultivating these other parts of myself but also like realizing that even those other parts of myself are like kind of unnecessary like yeah. I always thought that my value lied with me being able to like make art and be smart and funny and if like that was the reason that people wanted me around was because I could put on a little show and mm -hmm. now that I get older I realize that like the people who really care about me don't need me to put on a little show and that they would love me even if I never made anything ever again oh and that's really special <laughs> that is that's I <laughs> I called this with my partner, like when we allow people to see like the disaster baby sides of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that like that first moment when it's like, you kind of see, oh yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> that that's, that's really when when the love and compassion comes out when you're just like, why are you crying? Oh, I'm crying because you were nice to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Those are the moments where you're like, oh, okay. Yes. And that's, I'm glad that you have sorted this out um, at an earlier age than I certainly <laughs> sorted that out. I'm like flipping well played on that one. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm trying to take advantage of like my, my mom's a very spiritual person and like she got into spirituality actually because of my piano teacher that I had when I was younger who like taught us all about like meditation and spirituality in general Ooh. and like my mom you know she's almost 60 and so for her like that journey has really been in the last like 10 to 15 years and so I am trying to like reap the benefits of like her knowledge now yes. um and also, like, I see, like, my dad, who, like, has not taken to spirituality in quite the same way. Like, there's still a lot of stuff that he's, like, trying to unpack. And, like, he's trying to incorporate the things that my mom's always talking to us about, about gratitude, spirituality, and those things. But I know it's harder for him in the way that it, it has always been harder for me. And mm. so I'm trying to just, you know, get a little bit ahead of the game. Like, I think that as a young person... I mean, I feel like I know people often who are like, your 20s are for like being a disaster and not knowing what's going on. And I think that's really helpful as a mantra for when you're working hard and things are not materializing the way that you would like. But I think mm -hmm. it would be a real crutch to like not work on yourself because right. you're like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I have so much time. I'm only 20, whatever. I have all this time to become a better person later and to become a more together person later. And so I'm trying to spend a lot of my time like at least laying the foundation of learning those lessons. So mm -hmm. I don't spend the, my entire adult life not learning things that like I already kind of knew when I was younger. Like I'm trying, like mm -hmm. to the point about like, oh, I would make different decisions in my teens with the information I have now. I'm also trying to make different decisions now than the decisions I would have made when I was a teenager. Like I see myself slipping back into old patterns all the time. Like I'm a pretty anxious person. And so I try like when I'm having anxiety about something that's like an old thing, like something that plagued me when I was a kid. It's like, well, I have better information now. I have better coping, coping mechanisms now and better tools how can I use those to make different and better decisions for the girl who can't? Cause it's already oh. happened to her. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's so powerful to recognize because we all do want to do like the familiar patterns. It's like, we all have a blueprint inside of us that has formed over time that we're like, Oh, that's the thing I want to do. But I like what you said a lot about recognizing what's different now in the present. Like I was talking with someone about even like kind of like trauma informed care where it's like, Basically, when something happens to us that's like scary, like we want to protect ourselves from that. So say like, it was funny. I was like, <laughs> I was at lunch when I was discussing this. So I was like, okay, so say we've got a knife and a fork and like the knife hurt us, but the fork is okay. However, our brain sees these and goes, oh no, utensils. <laughs> like, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah. 
That's so real. <laughs> danger, danger. Well, let's unpack that, actually. Yes, yes. And so I was just like, so if we know that knifey, knifey path is bad, but like forky, forky path is okay, how can we like recognize the difference and really focus on like, well, like I see like the forky path actually has like more tines on it and like the handle is curved differently. Like that's what's different about the present. And I know knifey past was bad. Like we can see like sharp edge of knifey past. <laughs> like, <laughs> But we can like differentiate between the two so we can more accurately react to like new forky path. <laughs> like, and that's so, and, but, but, but even still, like, I feel like even when we know like that one thing is better for us than something else, like if the bad thing is the familiar thing, we're still going to go for that. Like, yes. Like, it's so much easier <laughs> to do the thing that's bad for you just because it's familiar. And it's like, yes. like sometimes the feeling of like, well, I don't know what's going to happen if I do this thing that I think is healthy for me. It's like, that's the biggest sign that you have to do it because if what you, if you know that something bad is going to happen doing the other thing, but the new thing is uncertain, you might as well go for the new uncertain thing. Cause it's like, why would I do something I know is going to upset me when I have like, a <laughs> lot of doing something that might yes. be actually good for me? <laughs> I'm sometimes like, how did this work out in the past? Did that work out well? <laughs> like yeah, it's like, it's like, and it really is so it is very comforting. I've noticed that it's very comforting to be sad because I mean, I listen, I'm a person who listens to sad music when they're sad and listens to sad music when they're happy because Same. being sad is a really is actually very easy. Being happy is very difficult. Yes. Um, and I think the thing that that for me always gets me through sadness. I'm like, well, if I'm sad, then that means eventually the sadness is going to be over and then I'll be happy. But when I'm happy, I'm like, well, that means the happiness is going to be over. Now I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Oh, it's like working on figuring out how to be present in both feelings without worrying about what's coming next. So there's no pressure on the sadness to resolve itself quickly into happiness. And there's no pressure on the happiness to remain happy past when it necessarily can do that. Yes. Like Um, the expiration date of the happiness. Yeah. It's like not being concerned about the expiration expiration date of any feeling and just being like this is where I'm at right now I'm like being sad is hard but it's like you can always find I I, one thing I do is I I have an app called one second every day Hmm. using it since 2018 and it's it's, it's exactly what it sounds like you film one second of every day at the end of the year you just like press a button and it turns it into a montage of your year Whoa. And um, I often add a uh, voiceover and music. And in my 2021 montage, one of the people who worked at the app commented on my my thing and was like, okay, you've you've cinched it. We're going to add voiceover. <laughs> so, like, I was doing it manually in logic every year. Oh. Um, but, but the thing that was really helpful to me about doing my one second every day is that like whenever, obviously since 2018, I've been sad. No one will be surprised to know that in the last four years, there have been days where I have not been happy. Yeah. <laughs> I I would still find one thing to film every single day. And so that it really taught me how to like every single day find just one moment worth remembering and worth supporting and admiring. And like that, it's 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 no pressure because you're like, okay, I can be sad the whole day. I just have to find like 15 seconds where I'm gonna be grateful for something or excited about something, and then I can go back to being sad. And it just forces oh. you to recognize that like there is no such thing as like a completely lost day or week or year because you can always find like, even if it's literally just like, I made myself a really nice cup of coffee. I went yeah. outside with the, at, while the sun was setting. Like you can find a moment that's like worth salvaging. I love that that exists because I did an experiment like that um, in last summer where like, I just called it a thing of beauty where I had to find oh, yes. like something every day. Yeah. I did like, that as well. I did that yeah. with photos um, at the in summer of 2021 because I um, I developed a chronic condition and like it's it's chronic hives, which just says I mean I was just itchy all the time, and uh, I feel this vibe in my soul. Keep going. <laughs> uh, now, fortunately, I'm on uh, good medications and I'm like working on my mental health a lot, and both of those things are really helping. But when it first started, I like had no functioning, med- nothing was working, and so I. And I realized that the first month that it was going on, all of my photos were just like of my hives, like on my, oh. phone, on the back of my camera roll. It was just me taking photos of my symptoms. Oh and no! I realized I was like, this is going to go on for however long it's going to go on. Eventually it's going to get a lot better, but it's still going to be a part of my life. And like, I cannot let my life just be a camera roll full of photos of my own skin. Right. Like I need to. Right. And so I started taking, I didn't, the project didn't last super long, but for a couple of weeks I was t- made sure to take a photo of something beautiful every single day so that I would have a record of it. So I love that you also did that project. Yes. Ah, oh, and it's such like, it's such a great touchstone. And like, now I'm curious about that app. Cause like it's in those times, especially when you feel like either you can't see kind of like your way around something negative that's happening. Um, 
like I had to move around a whole bunch this summer because like I was like TLDR, like my ceiling joists were moving in the condo that I live in. Like literally it sounded like I was like in a haunted pirate ship. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, and I was like, it was one of those moments where like I was like, have I finally lost it? Like, I mean, I know I'm in my home a lot, but like, have I finally just completely gone off the deep end? But lo and behold, I like had a structural engineer come out and he's like, no, like literally the wood beams in between your unit and the unit above are like moving. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. Um, so they had to take apart like my whole ceiling, but they didn't know how long that was going to take. Um, so I couldn't like rent a consistent place. It wasn't like, oh, you're going to be displaced for a month. So I was like bouncing from place to place, which is really disorienting for me. Um, And I was noticing like its effects on my mental health. I was just like, I already have ADHD. Um, Now I had, it was like ADHD plus, like, like, (laughs) Like you got the premium version. Yeah. I was like, can I unsubscribe? (laughs) it was bad. Like it was like, I hadn't realized how many systems I had set up so that I could just have like baseline functioning. Like I would be like wandering around the house, like the John Travolta gif at my friend's house, just being like, (laughs) I don't know where breakfast is. I don't know how anything starts. I don't know what's happening. (laughs) (laughs) And so it was a good focal point to just be like, you know what? I'm going to find like at least something to like ground me in what's going on right now that I like. (laughs) Like, (laughs) And that's going to be where we're going to (laughs) begin. So important. And like, it often is like the silliest things that like can get you through like difficult times. Like when I was in college, like I overall really, really loved college, but there were periods where I was like definitely depressed and like not looking forward to going to my classes. And like the thing that like woke me up, I eat honey nut Cheerios for breakfast every morning. Awesome. And um, I really, I got to the point where, you know, if when you eat a meal consistently enough, your brain just immediately craves it. Like the cue of waking up is like, I need this meal. <laughs> yes. And so I started looking forward so much to my bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios every morning that like it would motivate me to wake up and like get out of bed. And like that was all I needed to like start the day was the knowledge that I was going to have my Honey Nut Cheerios. Like, and I would have my like hour before classes started to like watch New Girl on my computer and eat the Cheerios. Yes. It was like the Garrett, because like no matter what I had at school, like if I had a midterm if I had something that stressed me out if there was a person I didn't want to see it was like but I know that for the first hour of the day I am going to be in my tiny little apartment eating my honey nut cheerios at my desk Mm -hmm. so everything I think is gonna be just fine (laughs) that yes that's like the importance almost of like personal ritual yes like I've been advocating for this for people for a long time because I hadn't realized even how many rituals I had until like uh, they were disrupted. (laughs) Yeah. When you're, I I think about that a lot for some reason, like when I'm going through my morning routine, like my mom got me an espresso for Christmas. And so of course, every day since then I have been making one or two very large lattes in my home every day. Excellent. Um, And I, when I, I used to have a slightly different morning routine before I had the coffee machine, I would make tea but I always like did everything in a very specific order and I like timed it out. So it's like, Oh, I'm going to brush my teeth while the hot water is steaming up. Cause it's like exactly two minutes, however long it is. Mm-hmm. It takes. And I realized I was like, Oh, if you dropped me in someone else's morning routine, I would have no idea what to do. <laughs> and if, you, the, if they were dropped in my morning routine, they would have no idea what to do. I'm like, Oh, my life is easy. And like my routines make total sense. But I like think about if someone who wasn't a musician, like received like the emails I received or like was put in a studio they would be so overwhelmed and stressed. Out. Yes. <laughs> and like for me, like it's stuff that excites me or like that seems challenging but doable. And like I know that other people who work in like, I don't know, consulting, God, I don't know what consulting is, but someone's doing it probably. I have zero like, idea. To- if you told me to do that, I'm sure they'd be like, oh, my job's not that hard. But I'd be like, but I have no idea what that is. And so that, that really, I feel like when for some reason that thought always pops into my head and it really calls into attention all the rituals that I have developed without really meaning to. Yes. Yes. And that like, what you just said about like the perspective of like, you know, if you were kind of like dropped into someone else's life, because I feel like in some ways, like over the last few years, our lives have become like on one hand, increasingly insular, but also we've been able to like observe other people's bubbles. I don't know how else to put it where it's like, because we are so online right now, it's like, I personally still don't have insight into like what people do at say like an office job, which I feel as though I should in like my seasoned years, but like, I genuinely don't know, but I do have more insight now into the things that people have shared about like either their rituals or their artistic practices or about like 
like I've been watching so much content online about people explaining about like their mental health things. Like I have so much more insight into so many more things, but there's always like things that I'm like, that's just kind of unknowable to me. Like, I don't know what that experience is like at all. <laughs> like, I think it's like, I think because of the internet and like, uh, like, especially like, I'll get, I guess I'll say my generation's like obsession with authenticity, like Gen Z is like very savvy about like when people are f- being fake or when we're being fed things that are like not a hundred percent real. Right. And like on the one hand, that's kind of good because like, we're not as susceptible to advertising and like, you know, we're not a lot of Gen Z is questioning of capitalism, which is really exciting. And like, all of those things are good. But on the other hand, it's like we have, there's this expectation that people are always going to be 100% themselves. And this idea that it's possible to like know someone with whom you have a parasocial relationship, which oh my God, yes. And like, even in your personal life, like you can't, there's, it's it's impossible to fully know and not to get into that conversation, but it's impossible to fully know another person. Yeah. Like even with my like family and friends, like I am very, very close with every member of my family. We're all very close with each other. I'm very lucky in that way. I had, I've been more critical of like the idea of a nuclear family for the last couple of years, but it's weird because like I have the perfect idyllic nuclear family. (laughs) are still married and in love and obsessed with each other. And like my dad works and my mom stayed home and like me and my brothers are all best friends. Like I fully hit the jackpot on that. Um, but I, I, even though we're all very close to each other, I think constantly about how like you, I, they don't fully, fully know me. Like the only person yeah. who fully, fully a hundred percent knows me is me. And that, is, right. and it's, it, I think the internet is forcing us to push up against that because we have this unprecedented access into other people's minds and lives, but we still don't know everything. And then we, and we get, we get mad. So when people do things that disappoint us, the masses get angry. Cause like this goes against the idea that I had of you. And it's like, well, why did you think that you had a complete idea of a person that you've never met or that you barely know. Right. And that I've been exploring parasocial relationships just in general. Like, I'm so glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking with a friend of mine that I recently collaborated with about like she at the beginning of the pandemic was working as an esthetician Mm -hmm. and got sick. And like we hypothesized she probably had COVID because she was really sick for like two months. Like like January of 2020 yeah. and she got let go from her job, but she's always been an artist and musician and whatnot. And so <laughs> she uh, decided to film herself in lingerie in her Tesla recording an album oh, wow. <laughs> and she put it on OnlyFans and she's now a very successful creator on OnlyFans. I mean, what um, a unique idea for a, for an OnlyFans page. That's right? so cool. <laughs> she just was like, like she put up like foil in her window. She's like, I think that all of my neighbors just assumed that I was like doing something horrifyingly illicit. Yeah, um, that sounds just sick though. <laughs> right? Oh my, it's great. Like, I'm like, she's a genius. I love working with her. I just admire her so much. Um, But like, it, like that was what she did. But now like she and I had always talked about, you know, what it means to be like, kind of like a person on the internet and creating this like chimera of yourself, of pieces of yourself, but it's not your whole self. And also no one can actually know your whole self and yourself changes. And it's like, she and I've been talking so much about like the way that people interact with their concept of you that they have from the internet. And like that, yeah, people will sometimes get really mad And people will get mad sometimes in real life too, if you act in a way that's not congruous to like their image of you that they had in their mind. Um, But it's more so with like the parasocial thing where it's like people develop these relationships with a part of you, but it's, yeah, it's very, yeah, we've been getting real nerdy about it basically. Cause we're just like, well, what does that mean? Like, and then how do you interact with that person? Like she was talking about like chatting with like actual fans on her site and same thing with like chatting with people that know you through socials or like have heard your songs it's different than someone who say like is chilling with you while you're like actually brushing your teeth while you're waiting for your your tea kettle (laughs) that's a very (laughs) yeah it's fascinating to me yeah and I I always wanted when I was younger I always thought like that like when I saw people who had platforms and the way they interacted with their fans like I was like oh I'm just I'm going to respond to everybody like I'm going to be like so present for my audience like if I get a platform like I'm just going to be answering fan DMs and comments and questions all day and like now I don't even have a super big platform but the platform that I do have I'm like that's just insane <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> Even though I like technically quote unquote have the time, like I could do it while I'm like, wait, like, you know, waiting in the back of an Uber or like while I'm on a plane, like I could be doing that. It's like, I don't want to because it demands too much of my social battery. Like I'm not an extrovert. I really like being by myself. 
And especially interacting with people I don't know drains me in a way that interacting with my like close circle doesn't. And so like the idea that I would answer the hundreds of DMs that I get every single week. And then that, and the problem with that is it's not just like a one-off interaction. It's like, it opens the door to prolonged conversation. Yes. And so it's like, oh, now I get, so like, oh, I've, I do try to answer a lot of fan DMs, especially when people reach out to say like really, you know, profound, meaningful things. Like I want to make sure that they know that I've seen it. Um, yeah. You know, some, some of those people are like very content with the one response back and they never message me again. And they're like, that's all I needed. Mm-hmm. Some people will message me like every week and I'm like, oh, I didn't, this wasn't supposed to be like a dialogue. Like this was just a, like, I appreciate you. I see you like, I can't afford to have that many open conversations going in my life at once. Like it's just not obviously not sustainable. Yeah. It's overwhelming. And I feel like it's interesting because I, I feel very similarly. Like I, I always was just like, Oh, like if only I could talk to like my favorite people. And like when people reach out about my music, I would talk back to them. And like, it was like this kind of idealized vision in my mind. Um, and now, like, if you had told me a few years ago, by the way, that I'd be trapped in my home and talked to over 100 people via the internet for a podcast, I'd be like, I'm going to do what? <laughs> like, yeah. Because bizarrely, I have gotten to talk to like my favorite people and then other people listen to those conversations. And I'm like, what? <laughs> um, well, that was my Valley Girl roots coming out. That was pretty funny. I was just like, yes, I am indeed from the Valley. Me too amazing (laughs) my parents sent me to Buckley um where then like I hated it so much and the one time I got in trouble was because in first grade I was doing a sixth graders homework for fun on a dare so they were like okay maybe this isn't the school for you um so they sent me to Sierra Canyon um my little brother went oh my god yeah I went to so me and my older brother went to the Merman school (laughs) oh my god you know about Merman uh, yeah, because then, uh, spoiler alert, I then went to Harvard Westlake for 7th through 12th grade. So did I. Wait, what are you talking about? When what? did you graduate? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What do you mean? I was like, I don't wanted to go to Taft because in Harvard Westlake, it was so Harvard Westlake. And I was like, no, I want the exotic experience of, like, no, whatever right. Taft is. The same. I literally was, I told, we would drive by Taft and I would tell my parents, like, oh, like, I could have gone there and, like, been a public school kid and would have been, aw-. they're like, you would have been so viciously bullied. Yes, because, like, my neighbor went to Taft and he and I grew up together. And it's oh like, we would always be, like, rollerblading on our cul-de-sac and, like, hanging out and being, like, he was, like, the one kid who treated me like I was totally normal, even though, like, I clearly was not. Um, But it's, like, he was so sweet. His name's Dustin. He lives in Hermosa Beach now. Um, But it's, like. did you graduate from Harvard Westlake? I graduated in 2000. Like, I'm ancient. Okay, okay, okay. Because my older brother, I had an older brother and I was, like, maybe there was overlap, but he graduated in 2012. Oh, see, like that's yeah, ancient Bogwitch energy. Like my sister, <laughs> my sister graduated in '95, like right after they merged. And it's like my parents saw, like you know, I was in all the while well, you went to Merman. It was, and I'm sure you probably did like the same things I did, like all the like Johns Hopkins tests, like all those things, like of all the like, oh, you're a weird gifted kid. Let's just have you do all the weird gifted kid things. And so that. <laughs> Yeah. And so my parents like were like, no, you are not going to like a normal person school. I was like, you are only making me weirder. (laughs) That was absolutely how it felt. I was like, please, maybe I'll have a fighting chance. (laughs) They were like, you just like, I mean, yeah, because of the, I needed a place that would stimulate me sufficiently academically. And even though my, you know, my high school experience was very hard academically. Um, it was the place ultimately that I needed to be. But I think it's so fascinating that we had such similar <laughs> experience. That is wild. I tell people that like having gone to Harvard Westlake, nothing else afterwards actually seems that challenging. It's almost like you've gone through the hardest thing you could do. Yes. <laughs> like- <laughs> because so I, yeah, so I went to USC for college and Obviously, like for most people, that's considered a really, really good school. And I consider it a really good school. But yeah. Harvard Westlake, you know, 20 or 30 kids get in there every year. I wouldn't say it's considered a safety school, but like, right. energy is definitely different. Yes. Um, and when I went there, like I studied music. So obviously that was not like academically difficult, but I ha- had to take general education classes. Yeah. And those classes I also found quite easy. Right. Um, and I was surrounded by people who were thought it was really hard. And I was like, my high school asked so much of me that there was just no way 
that anything after this could possibly be hard. And my older brother went to Harvard and he was like, Harvard was easy. And I'm like, for yes. you, for you. <laughs> yes, that was exactly, that's so funny. My whole family went to USC, except for me. I, I was like the weirdo that was like, I want to go to a liberal arts college. And everyone was like, <laughs> wow, how daring. <laughs> like, scandalous. Yes. Like I definitely, I remember like my advisor at Harvard West, like actually had me talk to another advisor to like make sure that that's really what I wanted to do. Mm, yeah. yeah. No, um, I had that experience as well because so my, I had an, one advisor in my junior year and he told me that I could not get into an Ivy league school at the time I wanted to go to Brown. And he was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. like, All right. I'm still going to apply, but I'll keep my expectations low. And then the next year I had a different advisor who told me that I could get into an Ivy League school and in fact insisted that I apply early to one because what? I wasn't applying early anywhere. And he was like, I just want you to get a letter in December when all the other kids get letters. I don't want you to have to wait so long. So just apply. If you don't get in, you don't even care. But if you do get in, you'll have a place that you know you could go if you end up not doing this whole music school thing, which by the way, I don't understand and no one else understands. And I was like, ah. okay. So I applied to Harvard and I got in. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> And I was like, so that first college counselor was full of it. Good to know. Yep. And, um, yep. and then obviously, like, I still wanted to go to music school. Like, I knew USC was what I wanted. I didn't want to go to a conservatory because yeah. I had these other interests and the idea of just studying music in college felt limiting. I wanted to make sure I could take other classes. But I didn't end up minoring, but I wanted the option to be open and yes. just to feel like I could meet lots of different kinds of people. I knew that surrounding my, I had surrounded myself the previous years with just these really intensely competitive academic kids. And I wanted right. to be around super creative kids, but also other flavors. Yes. Um, and so when I got into USC, I immediately put my deposit down because I knew that was what I wanted. And of course, everyone at school who found out that I had turned Harvard down was like, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing yes. this? And I was like, I just know myself really well. I know we're only 17, but like, I know myself really well. And I know that if I didn't go to this school for the rest of my life, I would be wondering what if. Yes. And for, I know that like, even though I, in theory, could like do music on the side in college, which is what I'd planned to do before I found out about the music school at USC. I know, I knew that I wouldn't pursue it with the same degree of rigor or intensity. Um, and I don't think I, my skills would have increased at the rate that they did. Um, so right. I knew that ultimately if I was serious, about being a professional musician, which I was and am, I knew that like getting into the school and going to that school was like definitely the right decision. And looking back now, I know it was the right decision. Like B Boston is cold. Like <laughs> <laughs> my older brother went to Harvard undergrad and Stanford law. So me and my little brother didn't, my little brother also goes to USC now and he's also in the music school. Oh my God. The reason that I think went over so well with my parents was because my older brother did the Harvard Stanford thing. So we didn't have to. Yes. Um, Yes. But yeah, my older brother ended up going to Stanford for law school and he's not a lawyer now. He didn't want to, he realized he didn't like the law, but um, when he was at Stanford, he loved like the Stanford's campus. He loved the people that he met there. He loved the energy and he like, he's a California boy. Like we're all California people. Yes. And the only reason that he even went to Harvard in the first place was because he's like, well, that's the best school, right? And I'm the best. So I'm going there. And like, yes. that was what he did. Yes. And so I think like he kind of now is finally making decisions based on like what he actually likes and what he's actually interested in. And he's doing really well. He's like in venture capital and he's like very good at it. <laughs> um, but like, I think he, like he, I don't know that he would have ended up in that career if he had not started taking like his own desires and interests so seriously. Yeah. Um, his whole life he was like, I'm good at school. So I'm just going to take all the hardest classes and I'm good at basketball. So I'm going to play basketball and like, I'm going to go to the best college and I'm going to go to the best law school. And it was all about just like cultivating this image of I'm number one and like not really being super invested in like what he actually wanted and he wasn't unhappy but he just wasn't that like jazzed about anything until he started yeah. doing this job and now he's like so passionate about his work he wants to talk about it all the time and like I love hearing about it because I love when people are excited about stuff and talk about stuff they're excited about big same um, and it's like and I, that, it's how I've always felt about music and so like I'm very lucky that I and, and all other forms of writing as well but like I'm very lucky that when I was like three years old and I learned how to read I was like I like writing stuff I'm constantly writing little poems and little stories and singing to myself like that's been very consistent essentially since I could talk. And I know that that's unusual to like know exactly what you want from such a young age. Um, but it's definitely what informed me making all of my decisions about like what I would do in my adult life, even when it was the decision that other people didn't understand or the decision that even I felt was painful, but knew was. Hmm. I'm like, so in creepy news, we had parallel childhoods. Yes. Um, I was like, <laughs> 
I was just like, this is spooky. It feels like you're reading my tea leaves and my journal. Like 15 years behind. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, that is, and yeah, like when you were talking about, especially having in a way that like that confidence to make the decisions that are right for you, even if other people don't understand them. And even if sometimes you don't fully understand them at the time, like how you were talking about how you wish you could go through high school now, but it's like a friend of mine commented, um, it's actually the first person I dated, like she said something interesting about me that like (laughs) just resonated in this moment where it's like, she's like, you know, she's like, you're the most consistent person I know. And I was like, why? And, and she was like, well, you were like this in high school. It's just that you're like better and more confident at it now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The ideal scenario is not that like it, with regard to our conversation about like having the steep rate of change, it's not that you like do a complete 180 and become a completely different person, but you just really grow into yourself. Yeah. It's like, and having that confidence to go to music school, because I felt similarly in that I did like, I toured at Oberlin and was like, I think this is like too much music. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like that was too much um but then I ended up like I minored in music and I majored in psychology uh, mm-hmm. I majored in classics and almost double majored in psychology I missed that major by one class so technically oh. I just I did the Harvard Westlake thing where everything was easy so I was like yeah of course I'll have like two majors and a minor in the honors yeah. program and finish a semester early and just like work on a thesis while nannying that makes sense yeah just giving Lisa some Simpson, just absolutely <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> but it was it was that knowing of like I always wanted to do music and I knew in some ways I wanted to do it professionally but I I think that you came into that knowledge almost earlier than I did because I definitely struggled with like how much do I want to do it professionally and how much do I want to keep it to myself and where does that where does that leave me like I resisted for a long time scoring work for whatever reason, despite the fact that I was good at it. And then in my thirties, I leaned into it and now I'm much better at it. But I'm like, I wonder what it was about my teenage self that was like, I don't want to do that. Despite the fact that I was good at it and enjoyed it. It was maybe an ego thing of like, oh, I only want to serve my own vision, not someone else's. And then when I was older, I was like, damn, that's very silly. (laughs) I think I mean, I think at a subconscious level, I, I try to tell this to friends of mine who are like not pursuing music like full time. They maybe are doing it as a hobby and they're like, well, but maybe I want to do it. And I'm like, are you sure you don't want this to just be a hobby? Because like I am definitely grateful for all of the opportunities I have. I know I'm doing the thing that is best for me right now mm-hmm. uh, and that being a professional musician really is like where I'm thriving. But at the same time, like when I was in college, I had I just spoke at um and like on an NYU songwriting Zoom recently, and I was talking about like the disillusionment that I experienced in early music school because I feel like most music students have a period of like being overwhelmed by all of the rules and structures we're asked to learn, and like having that sort of suck the joy out of music a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I had that happen on and off a couple of times when I was first at music school, and then it, it passed, and I realized that knowing more about how music worked was empowering and not like frustrating and boring. Yes. Um, but at the same time, it's like I definitely did have moments where I was like, why didn't I just keep this pure? Like when I was in mm-hmm. high school, this like especially because like Harvard was like didn't have a super intense music program. Like all of my music enterprise consisted of me sneaking down into practice rooms during free periods to play the piano. Like (laughs) I was writing songs during my free periods. And when I got home from school, if I got bored doing homework, I would just swivel my desk chair over to my keyboard and I would write a song. Like it was very much the thing I was stealing away to do Mm. in college. It became the thing that I had to do. And I found myself stealing away to do other things like writing novels and screenplays and poems because I felt like that was some sort of a coup and like my way of reclaiming my time and doing something that was like unimpeded by structure or grades or expectation or criticism. Right. And um, I think whenever I talk to people who are like considering doing music full time and it's not something they were like super drawn to their whole life. I'm like, maybe it should just be for fun for you because it's really hard. People say like, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But that's like absolutely not true because when you do what you love, one, it becomes your livelihood and you rely on it to live. And then also like you are now like having to do all this other stuff that doesn't actually have to do with the thing you love. Like I love writing songs and performing and recording music. I don't love like doing my like weird music taxes and I don't love like, (laughs) And I don't love like having like, sometimes I have really exciting creative meetings and sometimes I have meetings about logistics that make me want to go to sleep. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes I have sessions with people that I'm like, oh, this person and I are not clicking, but I have to be here for another five hours because like, that's just what you do. And like, yeah, there's definitely moments where I'm like, well, this sucks. But ultimately what I ha- realized in college is like every job is work. And every time I was like over romanticizing, like, oh, maybe I should just go get a PhD in English literature. Maybe I should go work in a bookstore in Oregon. Maybe that's <laughs> what I really want to do. Every time I would have those epiphanies, I'd be like, oh, that stuff would also involve doing a lot of work. And I think yep. the ratio of fun to work would be worse yep. than music. So like that, that's my advice for all the kids listening is every single job has parts that suck and you just have to figure out what, which parts that suck are you willing to tolerate? And also what's got the best bang for your buck? What has the best ratio of oh, yeah. to sucking? Because <laughs> there's no perfect scenario. Just as like what, there's no perfect relationship. There's no perfect job. There's no perfect house. Like any thing that you bring into your life that you're going to live inside of, whether that's like literal or metaphysical, like there's going to be parts of it that are bad. And it's like, you just have to figure out like, oh, at what point does the bad start to outweigh the good? And then at that point, then you can make a change, but you're never going to find something that has nothing bad in it. Oh yeah. And also that that might fluctuate over time. Like there might be a time that you're just like, you know what I actually really want is a PhD in English literature. (laughs) And it's like, you could go and do that. Like that's, I mean, it's funny because like that was originally the conceit of why I even started chatting with people on this podcast was that like, obviously, like (laughs) you might have noticed I'm a musician, Um, (laughs) but like in the midst of this, I realized I really liked teaching and I liked helping people and all this stuff. So I actually, I got a master's in clinical psychology because, because what else is a Harvard Westlake kid going to do other than get a backup master's? No, I'm totally Um, a master's at some point. It's on the agenda still. Oh yeah. It it was fun. It was, and it was the same thing where people are like, this is hard. And I'm like, ha, (laughs) 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 ha, Like you're funny. I just wrote a five page paper by like sneezing on this tissue. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, But yeah, like, and then I was like, well, why don't I open my own psych practice? And sure enough, I did. And then the pandemic happened. And now I have a staff of like seven people Um, that it was kind of funny. Someone was like, what was your what was your business plan? And I analogized it to a friend of mine had said, um, they were like, imagine you were the first person who ever did the conga. And I was like, well, how do you mean? And they were like, imagine you're at a party and someone says, grab my butt. Don't ask questions. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I feel like that's how my business went, really. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent, that is an excellent analogy for most times you're doing something that no one has ever done before. Yes. You have to do something really weird and you're like, trust me, just trust me. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, if you had said to me yet again, of like, you know, this is how these few years are going to go. It's like, you're going to be scoring some like really interesting video art. You're also going to be releasing your own music and learning to produce for other people. But Loki, you're also going to have like a group therapy practice. I'd be like, what? huh? That's too many things. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's like, you're allowed to do those things. And like, I'm always so intrigued by people who like, you're currently on like the 100% like professional musician path. And it's so interesting to me because sometimes people are like 100% in one thing, or you can be like, like 20% in five things. And like, all of those models are valid. I'm always so fascinated by like when people are for certain seasons, like dedicated to one thing and then other seasons, they're like these seven things. These are my chaos emeralds. These are like, yes, I'm really, I, I'll, first of all, thank you for that reference. I off, I tweeted a picture of, I think it was at the inauguration last year of like Lady Gaga going up to Joe Biden. And I think I tweeted Gaga chuckled. You mean the chaos emeralds? <laughs> got a good amount of love but some people are like, what is that and i was like oh so you didn't read the obama and sonic the hedgehog fan fiction got yeah exactly um but anyway <laughs> i was just like you're clearly not as online as we are <laughs> I'm, I'm so chronically online it's not good um but but yeah i am i i'm really working towards that season of having my my hand in like multiple different things and like I actually had a really great conversation my sophomore year of college with one of my professors. That was like during one of my periods of disillusionment when I was like, do I want to change majors? Like, yeah, it's working. And he was my songwriting professor, my performance professor, and my private vocal teacher. So like, we oh my goodness, a lot. Shout out to Sean Holt, my guru and best friend. Um, <laughs> I was in his office for a voice lesson, which our voice lessons, we did a few things where he was like, this is how you don't destroy your voice. And then the rest of our lessons were just him like telling me what life was about. Oh. And one of our sessions, I think it was like the day after like a performance class where I'd like had a hard time. And I was like, you know, 
like everyone in this program, like it was a small program. You'd only have like 20 people in the pot program at USC. And I was like, yeah. everyone in this program is like so dedicated. They literally like eat, sleep and breathe music. They're so obsessed with gear. They're so obsessed with like weird jazz. They've heard of so many artists I've never heard of. They love their DAWs. They're always telling me about plugins. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't really care about any of that. I only really care about like lyrics. Like I just love writing song lyrics as a vehicle to tell stories. And like sometimes there'll be a really especially beautiful string section or a really great guitar part. And like I'll get excited about it. But overall, music to me is about storytelling. And like that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I have all these other outlets for storytelling. Like I really love writing fiction. I really love writing screenplays and poetry. And I don't want to give those things up. But I also don't know if I should stay in this program where I'm like not giving it 150% of my attention when I have all this other stuff. And I was worried he was going to be like, yeah, you know, that's not going to cut it. And he was, his response was the complete opposite. He was like, don't make yourself small. Hmm. Like, do not shrink all of your interests down. Like, don't let go of any of that. All of that makes you who you are and it's all important to you and you're good at it. So keep doing it. Like you can be a musician who has other things that they're passionate about. You don't have to be all in. Yeah. And it was so liberating. And then also in one of our songwriting classes, he was telling everybody, he would always drop pearls of wisdom like this, but he was like, musician is not who you are. It is what you do. And it was so, he was like, I don't want you to feel as if, you know, if you hit a hiccup in your career, you get fired, you have a dry spell of not getting gigs. Right. You're not doing, like you're not, it's not like you've, you have not lost your identity in that scenario. It's just your job. And right. You can still make music, even if you're not doing it for a job. Like it is not... It, it is just what you do. It is not the core thing of who you are. And if you lost it for whatever reason, you would still be a full, complete person. Yes. And it's like, it was so freeing. Both of those like wisdoms were so freeing because I realized like, I, it's actually totally okay that there's all this other stuff I want to do. And I'm now realizing like, I'm def I definitely feel like for the next five to 10 years, like performing, recording, touring, writing, all of that stuff is going to be happening for sure. Yes. And then after that, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah. And giving yourself that space to like allow for change. Like when you were talking about the like, yeah, sometimes when you do something new, it actually is uncomfortable just because it's new. <laughs> um, but making space for that, that like, like, I don't know how I'm going to necessarily feel either in like 10 years. Like it's one of those things where I can maybe like anticipate a, like a few constants but it, I always try to leave space for like, what if something surprises me? What if something catches my interest? What if there's parts of myself I haven't explored yet? What if there's parts of the world I want to explore? It's like that is the realest one for me because I since I grew up in L.A. and then I went to college in L.A. and I live mm -hmm. in L.A. now, I've never lived anywhere else. And I always thought that I would definitely live in LA my whole life, even though I want to like travel. I love to travel and I plan on doing more of that as it becomes more likely that that's possible. Right. I love to travel and I plan on doing a lot of it. But I always was like, oh, but LA is home. LA is where I'm going to come back to. If I ever get married and have kids, LA is where that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I realized the other day, I was like, I that doesn't have to be true. Like, mm -hmm. I love my family. I'm very close to them and I want to live close to them. But if like ultimately like... I mean, I'm obsessed with London. I really want to live there one day. Mm -hmm. Like if I go there for three months to work on an album and I decide I don't want to leave, I can just stay. You're allowed to stay there. I'm literally in my 20s and can do anything right now. Uh huh. And, like, and if I like go, I mean, I plan on getting, like I said, a master's degree at some point. In my mind, I'm thinking it'll probably be in the UK, but I'll apply to a few different programs. And if I go to some city to get a master's and I fall in love with that city, maybe I'll stay a couple of extra years. And yeah. maybe ultimately where I move to next, like maybe I'll live there for five years and then come back. Like nothing is fixed. Yeah. Like, all of this stuff that I thought was like for sure going to happen. Like I realized was just kind of suffocating me. And I'm really excited about the pro like I like my deal with my label is for three albums. So I'm like, okay, I can foresee three albums into the future. That is what right. I can forecast. And after that, it's like, maybe I will move. Maybe I'll literally stop doing music completely. Maybe I'll just take a five year hiatus and then put out an album independently. Like I have no idea. And I'm like, for the first time in my life, I'm genuinely totally fine with that. Yeah. Like it's, it's one of those things where you're like, this is like terrifying, but also so exciting <laughs> because you're like, <laughs> Because, like, I yeah. didn't give myself that permission. And I honestly, I'm glad I didn't do it when I was a teenager. Like, I think if I'd gone outside of LA for college, even to like another part of California, mm -hmm. like, but I think I wasn't ready when I was mm -hmm. a teenager. 
Mm-hmm. Like I was very like I was I'm a very late bloomer in like every single respect. And like I just like wasn't ready to be alone and on my own. Like I'm really glad I was able to go home and see my family like every weekend. Like but I finally feel like I'm in a place where like I could totally live for three or six months in another city or even another country. And like I think I could just do it. Like I think I would just make it work. Yeah. But it's like maybe like that is it's a good thing that I spent all this time in LA because it like gave me the foundation I need to just try other stuff. And maybe I'll move somewhere else and I'll be like, oh no, LA's the one. And I'll call <laughs> But at least I'll know. It's supposed to be like, I'm pretty sure LA is the only place I want to live. It's like, I want to live in Brooklyn for a couple of months. I want to live yeah. in London for a few months. Like, maybe I should go live in Amsterdam. Like, maybe I should live in Spain. Like, I should relearn Spanish and move to Spain. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best part about like, I mean, I'm obviously biased, um, but it's like <laughs> one of the best parts of leaving LA for a little bit is actually the coming back to LA. Yeah. Um, because so far I have... I have never been somewhere that's like LA and other people have commented on that for better or worse. Um, but it's like, I remember cause I went to college up in Washington. I went to the university of Puget sound, which like is a tiny, tiny liberal arts college. Um, I wanted the opposite of Harvard Westlake just yeah, to be true. contrarian, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so I went to like this, like wonderful, like the school in the woods, um, and it was, there's a lot of trees and it was very misty. Um, and a lot of people ended up like settling in Tacoma that I went to school with. And like some people went up to Seattle and some people went to Portland. And I remember when I was like in my senior year, I was just like, you know, I feel like I went on my like sabbatical from Los Angeles mm-hmm. and now I'm ready to come back and also experience Los Angeles having left and also like. I mean, it's not like you're a full grown person at 21, um, but it's like to come back as like an adult instead of experiencing LA through like kid eyes and then teenager eyes. I was like, I want to experience LA through like adult eyes and see like what I see. And there are other cities that have resonated with me. Like strangely enough, like I could totally see myself living in Reykjavik, which I would have never anticipated. But like when I went there, like I've been there a few times now, it was the weirdest experience. I like got off the plane and I like took the bus into the city and it was completely dark. So it was in winter. And so it's like, literally like you're like driving through blackness and there's just wind. So I'm like, cool. I'm in like a little black wind tunnel. This is weird. <laughs> um, but like the sun was rising as we got into the city and like, you know, then I ended up going to like where I was staying down by the Harbor and like watching the sunrise over the Harbor. And I felt at home, which is a weird thing to think about someplace you've never seen before on like the other side of the planet that looks kind of like an alien landscape, not going to lie. But I felt very at home there. And like, I got to know the city immediately and I made friends there immediately. And I was just like, oh, okay. There's at least like one other place on this planet that I feel like, oh, this is like my place. Um, But it's very much like you have to go and explore that and like get a perspective on like where you've where you're from by leaving it for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> like, and like, I, I know that like that, like if my mom listens to this, she'll be like, how dare you? Because we're so close. And like the idea of me spending more than like a couple days away from her is just like not on her agenda at all. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think that like, I just, people always said like, you have to leave your hometown. And my, I always felt like, well, it doesn't really count for me because my hometown's LA. Yes. So cool. Yes. <laughs> I don't know that I necessarily need to go for like a super long time, but like, I think even if it was just like three months, like that yeah. would be so powerful for someone who's literally never been away from home for longer than two weeks. Like that would be very powerful. It is. And it's true where it's like, like I said, I'm biased. Um, I feel exactly the same way where like I've been other places. And like I said, I could see myself living in Reykjavik like part time. I don't know if I'd live there like full time, frankly. But it's like, we kind of have like everything here. And so it's hard to be like, if if we go to a different place, it's like, then we can go really hard on like one or two aspects of a city or a location that are different than Los Angeles. But like, we, we literally have this like kaleidoscopic range of things that like, even if you did a new thing in LA every day, every day before you died, like you, you still, there'd be more things. <laughs> like, there would be more things. There's more Los Angeles than there is of you. And so it's like, you just don't run out of like, or at least I don't run out of like inspiration here. It's just like, there's always familiar things to explore. There's always something novel to explore. There's always, and like, I love bringing people to the city and seeing it through their eyes. Like, yeah, I'm kind of in love with Los Angeles. <laughs> and like, I just can't, I remember like when I was graduating high school and people were like, I'm so excited to go somewhere with real seasons. I hate LA. It's not even a real city. And I was just like, 
I just not the vibe. Like my experience of LA, even though I had a a very like isolating childhood of like feeling like a little bit of a, not a loner, but like not super clicking with like the kids that I was around for pretty much my whole like childhood and teenagehood. Yeah. I still like loved LA. I've always loved LA. And like, I've always just felt like, like you said, like there's just, there is more of LA than there is of me. And like, I, if I haven't found what I want yet, it's somewhere to be found here. Yes. And like, obviously being a musician, like the fact that like, I remember like starting college and all the kids that were coming from other places, they were so overwhelmed by the move that they barely even like registered all of the things that went with like actually pursuing like a career. Like in their mind, they're like, step one, move to LA. Step two, oh my God, I'm in LA. And for me, because I was already here, it was like, I already had the feel, I didn't have the big fish in a small pond thing really ever. I was already in a big pond. And so it was more just like the fish, I was the fish that was progressively getting a little bit bigger as opposed to realizing that I was small, I already knew. Right, Um, right. And I think that like that obviously has given me so many advantages, like to have my full support system with me while I'm pursuing this really challenging Challenging career is very, very, it's a huge privilege to have. Um, yes. But yeah, it was, it, it's, it, it, I've always had this like very, uh, I don't want to say romantic because that makes it sound like it's not realistic, but like I've always had like a very positive relationship with the city of Los Angeles, even though whenever there's like a bad fire or an earthquake, I'm like, why do I live here? <laughs> God, I shouldn't live here. But then I, but t- that passes after a few days. <laughs> oh yeah, I was, I definitely was snarky at. I think was it Epicenter in Silver Lake? It was like two days ago. There was an earthquake, like just early enough in the morning that you wake up with that moment of qua. <laughs> I didn't. Um, know, but I saw. I saw that it happen. Yeah, it was one of those things where, like, I just kind of like opened an eye and was like, "Do I hop on Twitter? Was that? Do I care enough?" <laughs> like, <laughs> the LA conundrum of do I ask if that was an earthquake? <laughs> yes. And it was like just early enough. I remember it was kind of light outside, but not super light outside. I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> And it's interesting to think about like coming from LA and I just thought of the context of that, that it's like in a time when we couldn't see anybody, the thing that went viral was you actually writing a snippet that was based on the image of another LA artist. (laughs) Yes, 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 yes. That is something really interesting. I feel like part of my connection to Phoebe Bridgers, even though obviously most of it is she's just like really talented, is the LA thing. Like I, I really do see like, oh yeah, you grew up in Pasadena. Yes. Like I, I can tell. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's something very cool about like, yeah, just like knowing the same landmarks and stuff. Like obviously everyone knows about LA. It's not a secret. It's not an unknown right. secret, but like there's something about growing up here. Like the level of intimacy that we have with it is like, it's kind of rare. People always tell me I'm a unicorn right. from here. And it's like, obviously I, when I was growing up, everyone I knew was from here. So yeah. I didn't realize that it was special. And now when I meet people, they're like, Oh, that's so crazy. Like, what was it like? I'm like, I think like anywhere else, like, yeah. I mean, I did grow up in the suburbs. It's not like I like lived at the Hollywood sign <laughs> yeah. in the suburbs, like every other suburban kid. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like part of my connection to Phoebe Bridgers and, and anytime I find out an artist is from L.A., it like really opens up their discography for me. I'm like, OK, I can kind of like Doja Cat, I think, grew up in the Valley. Too. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, really? OK. Yes. <laughs> it's a that's so interesting that you said that about even like your connection to Phoebe Bridgers, because I feel the same way with like um, with the artist Jenny Lewis, where mm. it's like. Cause she's like a tiny bit older than me, but not like a ton older than me. And I remember seeing her like in movies when I was a kid and it's like the stuff that she writes, like, cause she grew up not that far from where I grew up in the Valley. And like, even just like going to acting classes as a kid and like, just kind of that whole culture. Yeah. Like it's so specific that like when I hear her songs, even when she's not singing explicitly about Los Angeles, it's like, I feel a similar connection of just like, okay, this person understands this particular, like kind of like this thread that's interwoven in my life too. Yeah. There's, there really is something about growing up in a place where everyone else wants to go. And I feel like I'm probably a lot of people who are from New York feel the same way. And I remember in like the very beginning of my freshman year of college, like meeting people who are from Manhattan and being like, wow, man. (laughs) 
And then people would hear that I was from LA and they'd be like, oh, wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> like, obviously, I can't possibly see it with this quite the same. I'm a very, I'm, I'm, I'm able to be mystical and I'm able to be magical even about things that are familiar to me, but obviously can't have quite the same mystique as someone who's just moved here like a week ago. It's right for them. For them, it feels so kinetic and, and insane and unlike anything they've ever seen before. Um, and I, yeah, my, I realize like my opinion of New York is probably how a lot of people feel about LA. Like, oh, it's so intense and crazy and I can never live there. It's right. Yeah. It's like, but if you grew up in Manhattan and you took the subway to school, you're like, yeah, that's just like what you do. Like, that's yeah, how you get to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like just the interplay of LA to New York. I remember I visited a friend of mine. Yeah, this was in college because I had met her when I was studying abroad and uh, her family lived in Manhattan. And it's like they weren't home when I got there, but they left like the instructions for how to like go up to their place. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like chilling in this like Manhattan apartment. And I was, I was thinking to myself, I was like, I got this. I totally got this. Like, <laughs> and like, I think I was like 19 or 20 at the time. And I was like, going to like slice a bagel in their kitchen. And I looked over and I didn't like really realize how close buildings were to each other. And I looked <laughs> over and there was like the window of another kitchen and there was a person in it. And I definitely screamed and threw the bagel. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> person is too close to enjoy bagel consumption. Yes. It was like, just, I malfunctioned and I was just like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't got this. Um, but <laughs> that's, that's like So the opposite of LA, like everything is so spread out. You would never like look over your shoulder and like see another person in their own kitchen. Like everything yes! is spacious. <laughs> yes. And it was like the funniest moment where I was just like, they're probably like just what happened to that is that person okay like i'm I'm glad that i threw the bagel like instead of the knife um but why, it's did, like... why did that mermaid just throw a bagel yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, what's going on over there <laughs> like, it was it was not a dignified moment um but it's like thinking about how particular place is i was also thinking about even the idea of like i don't know why it popped in my head but like going viral on the internet in general because it's devoid of context and like I'm so curious about the people that were like listening to your Phoebe Bridgers which then became your voice like I'm so curious what it sounds like to people not in LA when we're singing about LA yeah I think about that too and did you ever watch the cartoon The Proud Family no okay so there, it was on disney channel in like i mean it was like definitely like after your time like it was on in the early 2000s like for like babies gotcha um, so it was for me and um, <laughs> it was little babies who don't remember 9-11 yep and, um, yep and it was but it was about like it was about this girl who i so my mom is white my dad is black i thought that the characters on the proud family were a white mom and a black dad and my mom told me later in life she's like no that mom is just a very light-skinned black woman and i was like how dare you <laughs> It's my family. <laughs> and I was very confused. But the main character is Penny Proud, who is me. Um, but her, so first of all, her one of her best friends on the show is named La Cienega Boulevardes. <laughs> and I was thought that was such a hoot because I grew up, like, I t- took that street. It's a major street in LA, obviously. Oh, my and God. Like, I thought that it was so funny. And then also there's a character named Wizard Kelly, who you'll notice sounds similar to Magic Johnson. Mm -hmm. wizard kelly on the show had all of these like franchises like he had the wizard kelly like restaurant gym whatever just as magic johnson had his tgi fridays and starbucks and 24-hour fitness oh my god again i thought that was so funny but now as an adult i'm like who was that for like (laughs) only for children that like like, a few (laughs) neighborhoods of los angeles like who would know about that like i thought that was so weird Maybe it was for the parents that were watching it with their children that it's like, hey, if you have to watch this over and over again, we're going to we're going to put in some Easter eggs. For you. Easter eggs in. Yeah. And and Wizard Kelly was one of those car- famous cartoon characters who's too tall that you never see his face. <laughs> the bottom part of his body, um, which I loved. But yeah, I just thought that was so funny. Like, and it reminds me of like, yeah, when people talk about L.A. in pop culture, if you're not from here, like, does it all sort of run together to you? Is it all just like that's an L.A. reference? Do you are you not even aware that the reference is being made? Like, right. I wonder. Right. And like, and also it's so interesting that like, I was thinking about that it was essentially like a parody that then became a real song. And that to me is like quintessentially Los Angeles where people it starts as a joke and then it's not a joke. Yes. And it's like, it's a joke. It's not a joke. It's looped around again. It's funny, but it's not funny. Did you see the pathos in it? But also it's breezy, but also it's like, <laughs> like... <laughs> it's silver, like in a song. Yes. And it's like, there's this attitude that I think people mistake, like, 
the breeziness or easygoingness of Los Angeles for being vapid when it's kind of the opposite. It's like we have this darkness that's couched in this. Yeah, um, <laughs> that like, I mean, it's just the same as like you made a joke of slipping into your Valley Girl accent. Like people really assume that like being from LA nece- necessarily means you're dumb. And like, I remember in college when I would meet people and they'd be like, you don't seem like you're from LA. And I'd be like, well, what does that mean? Like, is it because I don't have blonde hair? Is it because I'm not doing enough yoga or drinking enough green juice? Like LA has 3 million, 4 million people in it. We have like hundreds of neighborhoods. Like like, there are so many different kinds of LAs and like the idea, like, especially on on TikTok and stuff, when I see people talking about how much they hate LA because it's so fake and it's all influencers, I'm like, okay, so you're the problem. Yes. (laughs) If you think LA is all influencers and it's fake, like you're only hanging out in like on like two streets. Like yes. there's so many different parts of this city. It's so racially diverse. There's such a diverse like income bracket background. Like there's such a diverse amount of religion. There's so much interesting art and food. Like there's no way to stereotype LA. It's too big. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so like, yeah, I think it's so sad that people associate being for, like the, like whenever I would say that I was from LA and people would say you don't seem like it, their response like, oh, well, you talk really fast and like you're really smart. Like I just assumed you were from like the Northeast or something. Yes. And, like, that's a bummer because like why can't the vision of LA include like intellectualism? I think that it's here. I, I encounter it often. I have a lot of really smart friends. I've met really, really intelligent people who grew up in Los Angeles and went to schools here. Like there's a like we have such it's such a rich culture and there's so much symbolism like our whole city is about telling stories yes yes and I feel like in some ways it's this weird dichotomy of like we're valued for that and devalued for that at the same time yeah people are so obsessed with it I mean it's similar I feel like how people think about women and like the beauty of women they're like oh we are obsessed with female beauty and we will prioritize female beauty of all else but also if you're a beautiful woman it means you're dumb and it's like that's how people think of LA it's like oh we love your movies we love the glitz and glamour we're obsessed with the celebrities you produce but also that's stupid and I'm above it. And it's like, well, yes, <laughs> yes. And that's like when we were talking about even the dichotomy of like how people perceive you as younger and how in some ways that's a good thing. And in some ways it's not a good thing. And like, it's very, very similar. Thank you for illuminating that because that helps me understand my own relationship with my city. <laughs> like, I was like, just a pretty face. We're more than just good weather and the pink wall. Oh God, the pink wall. <laughs> I just realized I explained that so loudly. It resonated in my floor tom that's like across my home from me. Good. That was amazing. I was Wait just like, drums. I was like, what was that sound? And I was just like, oh no, it's because I forgot to put the cover on the floor tom. Um, happens. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's so strange because yeah, like people are sometimes unwilling to explore the depths of LA because they don't think it's there. And I'm just like, I'm like, no, it's, it's, it is, it's the juiciness that's underneath that. Like it's the Jacaranda flowers. Like, yeah, they're really pretty. And then they get stuck to you and stay forever. Like, it's like, <laughs> I think a lot of the, the anger and like the judgment comes from the fact that like people see influencers to their eyes becoming overnight successes without doing any work. And suddenly they have all this money and fame and and access and, and material things. And so sometimes people will come here in pursuit of those things. And then when they don't get the same opportunities, they're like, well, it's all vapid and shallow anyway. Right. And it's like, the reason that you're so mad about, like, I don't get worked up about influencers for the most part, because I don't really want that. Like, I don't really want that life. Like, I don't really want to be famous. I just want to be um, the, I was talking to my publicist about this, like, I think it was a couple months ago. Like, she asked me, like, what do you want like, mm-hmm. out of career, essentially? And I said, I want the people who need me to find me. Aww. And I realized that, like, I kind of, it kind of came to me all at once. Like, I wasn't planning to say that. But then I realized that that was true. And it's become even more true as time passes. Like, I really, like, I would be happy, obviously, to be able to, like, make a lot of money so that I could do positive things with that money. But ultimately, like as long as I can make a living, like I don't need extra, any extra attention. As long as I, I I have to engage with certain attention grabbing measures so that I can reach the people who need me that haven't found me yet. But I don't need to go overboard to get extra people because if you're not going to be like a person who's transformed by my music, like you don't really need to be here. Like you can be if you want, but I'm not going to like force you. I'm not going to try to convince people that are going to get nothing out of my art to consume it. Like I'm not looking at a numbers game. Um, And so the whole concept of the influencer, um, I think that like, if that's a job that you want and it sounds fun to you, like you should do it. Cause I don't think people should like be barred from doing things that are fun. Right. Um, But yeah, I think a lot of people 
like, I mean, not to get into like capitalism, but like the U.S. has created such a scarcity mindset in society. And so people see someone else getting something and they think necessarily that means they can't get it. Like, mm. I'm not speaking up, so therefore that's one less millions of dollars for me. Right. And, uh, right. and so I think people get mad about the, that, the, the so-called superficial nature of LA for that reason. Cause they're like, well, if all these people are doing quote unquote, nothing for all this money, then what, how am I supposed to get money? Mm. Like, no, they're not, you're not even doing the same thing as them. It's a totally separate economy. And like, obviously there's so many problems with the influencer economy. Like I'm not going to say like it's only good, but like the resentment people seem to have for the, that culture in LA, like, I mean, obviously there are times when it's really bad. Like when during the pandemic influencers were throwing massive parties. Like during Yes. Yes. Like, like, like actually uh, endangering people. Don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> the endangering people thing is bad. I think the, like, obviously when people get away with uh, perpetuating racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia on their platforms, all of that is bad. Um, but the, the, the base concept of a person is a self-employed entertainer who like makes content in their home. Like, I think that is okay. Like, just cause you don't like the content, like someone's enjoying it. Otherwise they wouldn't be making any money. Exactly. And like, I love how you framed attention in a way. Like I remember someone said to me, they're like, Oh, this person's being so annoying. They're just like attention seeking. And I was like, yeah, we actually as humans do like attention. Yeah. You need it to live. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, it's okay that we want attention and you can have kind of like an intention behind wanting attention. Like yes. you want attention so that your music finds the people that it resonates with. And I was like, what a wonderful thing to want attention for so that you can connect with people over the thing that you're passionate about creating. I was like, that makes total sense. Yeah. I would actually be very happy if like no one knew who I was, but the music was doing what it needed to do. Like I, yeah. I someone told me tomorrow, like, okay, you're going to reach the exact number of people that you want to reach and you're going to make the exact amount of money you need to live comfortably. But like, no one's ever going to come up to you on the street and like no one without you pointing it out, no one will connect that it's you making the music. I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'll take that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like and the music is doing what it needs to do. And I get to live my life like unimpeded by people like trying to like know about my personal business. You're like, that sounds actually that sounds ideal. Perfect. <laughs> I don't want to be when I walk down the street. Like, and I, I also genuinely think that like, I don't know if anyone actually wants that. I think the people who they're def like the people who have it definitely cultivated it. But I think that they feel like they have to. I don't know. May, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe at a core level, they're like, I really love having millions of people invested in me getting a haircut. Maybe they like <laughs> But I, I have a feeling that they that really what they wanted was I want to be the best. I want to be at the top of my field. I want to make a lot of money. I want people to tell me that they love me all the time. And then the right. actual fact of it is just not healthy for the human brain. I'd be so curious to talk to someone in that position. And like, I was just like, shout out to my producer who will be listening to this. Um, at some point, like, I mean, as weird as this sounds, I would love to talk to Paris Hilton because I haven't since we were little kids because we went to Buckley together oh, and we actually so share cool. a birthday. Oh, wow. um, yeah, she's exactly a year older than me because um, she was in the grade above me. And I didn't realize that that's who it was until another friend of mine actually pointed out um, like he was going through like a bunch of old stuff at his parents' house. And he was just like, oh, yeah, I remember like Paris Hilton was in my grade. And I was just like, no. And then like, he like showed me her picture and I was like, wait, that was like the girl that had my birthday. <laughs> I was just like, wait, what? <laughs> we both bought cupcakes on the same day at school. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was just like, wait a second. Cause she was like friends with a few of my friends. And I was just like, I would love to talk with her about that because I mean, it's not like we were besties as little kids. It's just like, oh yeah, that's my birthday person. Um, but like to know what it is that draws someone to that experience and then what it's like to live in that experience. Like, because she actually is a very bright and talented person that yeah, that's crafted kind of the that thing. Like to, for me to discover in the, cause I feel like the height of her fame was when I was a kid and like, obviously the media depicted her as like an idiot. And I was like, I'll just go along with it. I'm seven. And yeah. Then, like in adulthood, like finding out like, oh, she's really smart. Like, why didn't anyone point that out before? <laughs> yes. And that it's like she capitalized on exactly like what you're talking about of that love hate relationship with like femininity and like kind of like the Los Angeles identity and all of that, that I was just like, that's brilliant in a way that I didn't understand at the time either. Like I was always kind of fascinated by her, especially once I realized like who she was, I was just like, that's so interesting. Like, and also like, 
I was like, also, of course, because it's LA, like my dad worked with like the Kardashians dad and it's like, they went to Harvard, uh, they went to Buckley too. Yeah. Um, and it's like, I didn't know them, but it's like, I knew who their dad was because I would sometimes be in the DA's office with my dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> so like weird stuff like that, where it's like, I don't really have a connection to them other than that. Like I would want to talk probably to Paris, but like, I find it fascinating that like, for whatever reason, and they're in my generation, there was this drive to create a cult of personality in a way that we've never seen before. And I, I want to know like why someone would do that. Because like you said, that's, it's like a heavy tax to pay in a way. Like I can't even, I sometimes even get flustered when people recognize me from like elementary school, (laughs) like much less when people like actually recognize me for something I did on purpose other than just like existing. Um, And so I would like, I personally would have difficulty with that. I think I'd be like, I'm not sure why you're talking to me. Question mark. (laughs) Yeah. It's very, it's very uh, baffling to me because especially because I talk to my friends about it sometimes. And some of them say that they want to be famous. And I, I realized that like it's, it's literally impossible to be so famous that you're constantly getting mobbed for years unless you really want it. And so, yes, cause like the, with immune, like that was an accident. I was obviously I've been trying to build a career, but it's not like I've tweeted that going tomorrow. This will have 2 million views and being interviewed by Rolling Stone. (laughs) (laughs) This is a very silly little joke that maybe a hundred people will see. And it was really, really intense. And the attention was really intense for about 36 hours. And then it died down because it always does. Yep. And the only way for a person to have, like the level of attention that I was getting, and also keep in mind, this was purely online. I don't think that if I'd gone outside that weekend, like I would have been stopped. Right. Um, but the only way to like convert that attention into like many years of like dogged pursuit by the press is to like create it. Like I firmly believe that like, even when a very famous person is complaining about like the difficulties of fame and how taxing fame is, I'm like, well, if you really didn't like it, like you could just step out of the public eye. And after a couple of years, the attention would decrease significantly Yes, um, because people just get bored if you don't give them anything else to think about and you don't give them anything else to feed on. Um, and so I know that like that it takes cultivation. And I think ultimately what those people have decided is like, I want to be performing at a certain level, like in certain venues with a certain degree of autonomy. And the only way to have the kind of, especially as a woman, the only way to have right. that kind of autonomy is to be like literally the most famous person to ever live. Right. <laughs> Like, I kind of get it when I think about it from that perspective. It's like, listen, if you want to play the Staples Center, that means you have to have enough people in your fan base willing to buy tickets at that for that venue. And like, I don't know how many people it is, 50,000, 90,000, a crazy amount of people. Yes. And if you want to play that size venue in like every city in the world, that's so many people. And that's so many diehard fans. Plus, you kind of need to have like at least another amount of like at least that many people times two of people who are like kind of casual fans. Right. That's just a crazy amount of interest that you have to generate. And so I realized personally, like my team disagrees. I'm like, I just want to play the Wilter. And they're like, you could play the Stable Center. And I'm like, I mean, maybe, but I don't care. Right. <laughs> I, really, I really just would love to play like, like the tour that I'm going on in April. I'm opening for Amos Lee on the East Coast. And all of the venues we're playing are these like beautiful theaters that are that seat like one to 3000 people. Oh. And like that is exactly like, I hope to be doing that as a headline tour two or three years from now. And like, right. that would be perfect. Like, I right. feel like that's the perfect space for my music. It would be like an ideal amount of fans. And if I could do that, plus ha- maybe have a podcast one day, if I could do that, plus have my master's degree, ha- be putting books out, like, I don't need to have every single part of my life be operating at a record shattering sales right. lens. Like that is just not something that I need. <laughs> and that's such like a paradigm shift. And it reminded me also of what you were talking about of how people were mad because they perceived even influencers as quote, not doing anything or like the idea of like overnight success. Like you went viral, but you also have been making music for years and studied music. And it's like, there's, there's a foundation there of years of things. And one thing did happen to like, I mean, it was a great thing, but it was like one thing you made happened to catch that attention. And it's like, that doesn't mean that like you were quote an overnight success. It's like, you were like that, that was like a decade of work. (laughs) like most people that like get really successful for one thing for the most part most people who get really successful for one thing it it is exactly that story of they were making so many things that no one noticed and then they're like ah and they threw up something without thinking about it and then that thing caught fire yes and it's like that happens 
so frequently. I was listening to, I think I was listening to your, to your wrong about, which is one of my favorite podcasts. Amazing. They're talking about how I think, I think they said it was an older episode and they were saying there's like 22,000 people on YouTube with more than a million subscribers. And like, we're just getting to a point where like most people know someone who's had some degree of like virality or internet fame. Yeah. Um, and it's becoming like less remarkable and it, re but, and, and to that end, like there, a lot of those people are people who worked really, really hard, but it was just one thing that happened to be the catalyst. And like, that's kind of how all of life works. Like big changes are rarely like, like literally one thing. Like it's like, right. even though it feels like a sudden abrupt shift, it's like for years, it was more months. It was building to that. And then there was the final thing that was, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. Like there was one thing that made you realize that the change needed to be made or one thing that made other people realize that the change needed to be made about you. Right. Right. It's like, there's that one little, it just kind of like, whoop, like pushes it over the edge. And like thinking about that also in terms of like kind of our culture of like optimization and like wanting to be the best. And it reminded me of what you said about your brother, like, well, of course I'll go to the best school and of course I'll do the best thing. And it's like, I remember feeling that pressure as well. And I feel like there's value in being not that you should like not give things your all, but there's value in doing stuff, even if it's not like the Beyonce and that's okay. I, I'm sure there are days where Beyonce is like, oh. <laughs> I don't want to do all of this today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I, that's been very freeing to me. I'm like finally um, starting to develop hobbies that I'm not good at. I never let myself do that before because like, I don't want to sound like vain, but like, I've always been a very skilled writer. And so whenever mm -hmm. I've picked up like other forms of writing that I hadn't tried before, they just came pretty naturally to me and I was able to do them with ease. And I, so I never tried to do anything else. Like I would draw and I'd be like, I'm bad at drawing. I don't do that. Right. And I would cook and I'd be like, I'm bad at cooking. I don't do that. And I would just not do it. But recently, specifically when it comes to exercise, I've always thought of myself as a person who didn't like exercise. I'm a couch potato. I'm lazy. I exercise my mind, not my body. Like, <laughs> And for some reason, like a few weeks ago, partly because this older brother of mine, the overachiever, he's um, running a half marathon next month because it, ah, wasn't it wasn't. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and he started, he was always really, really into fitness, but he never liked running. He always was like a guy who was like, he played basketball. He liked lifting weights, but he hated running. But mm. then he started doing like hit workouts. And then as a result, his like cardio skills improved rapidly. And he just kind of started running by accident. He realized he really loved it. And so now he mm. runs for long distances, like multiple times a week. He's going to do this half marathon. And he was like so excited about it. He was like, you really got, my whole family calls me JP. He's like, JP, you really got to try it. You really got to do it. Like you can just go really, really slow. It's fine. We're like walking down the street as he's saying this. And he breaks out into a jog to show me how slow. <laughs> and I'm like, dude. <laughs> but I was like, you know what? Why not? I'll give it a shot. So I started... I love going on long walks. What I started doing was I would put on a podcast. I would look at the clock on my phone. And as soon as it would like hit a new minute, I was like, I'm going to jog for 10 minutes and then I'm going to go back to walking. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now I do that like a few times a week and I look forward to it, which is impossible to believe that I'm doing <laughs> that. But I've been doing it. Yeah. For like the last month or so. And I'm like, genuine. I like, I like it. I am shocked to report Yep. Um, and it's hard. I'm not good at it. I'm very slow. I cannot run a full mile in 10 minutes, but I've decided that one of my goals is to run a 5k by the end of the year. Cause it's only three miles. And I'm like, I can right. run a 5k. And they, they usually say it takes like 30 to 40 minutes for like an average person. I'm like, if I can run a 5k in 40 minutes or less, I will have be so much farther ahead than I was in my fitness than I ever have been in my entire life. And it wasn't a New Year's resolution. It wasn't something that I like, you know, really planned. It's just like, I just feel better when I exercise. I know yeah. it's good for my mental health. I also read that it like helps prevent like cognitive decline, like Alzheimer's and dementia. And I was like, oh crap, I forgot about that. <laughs> and like, because of my, yeah. I know with like, with my hives and like with my anxiety, like all of those things are very intimately connected. And when I am doing things that reduce my overall anxiety and depression, yes. it makes everything feel better. I also start yes. eating way healthier. I like cut out a lot of processed food because I realize I feel very like weighed down and sad when like I eat like a lot of like baked goods and fried. Yeah. And it's like, do I don't even really super miss them for the most part. Like I'm still eating food I like and I'm still eating a lot, but I'm just like, oh, I probably should like not eat all this stuff that has all these weird ingredients that like we don't really know what they <laughs> <laughs> like listening to another podcast hosted by Michael Hobbs of You're Wrong About called Maintenance Phase, which has fully radicalized me about fat phobia. Now I'm like on a whole thing about that. But heck yes, they were talking about um, 
Halo Top, and they were talking about like snack wells, all the like. They go oh my god, yes! Ads. And they were talking about like erythritol, sorbitol, xylitol, all the fake sugars. They, I just listened to their episode about Olestra, and basically oh. all that stuff is just like not good for you. It's just not good for you at all. No. And it's like we've been tricked into thinking that it's good for us because they make you thinner, but in the meanwhile are making you super unhealthy and like ruining your metabolism and scrambling your hunger cues. Yes. Like, what if I just ate food that like I knew exactly what it was doing to me as a treat? <laughs> as a, just as a treat. And I feel what? better. I do feel better. I have more energy. I sleep better. Like I, I feel like I have fewer headaches. Like it's just, it's not like a huge difference. I don't like, I'm definitely not one of those like crazy people that's like, oh yeah, if you like eat vegan, like it'll cure all of your diseases. Like that's not I'm not there, but right. I do believe right. that like if you have chronic conditions and you have a diet that is like suitable for the, your needs, like it will make everything not feel as bad. It won't cure anything, but it will make everything feel a little better. Yes. That's, it's so funny. Cause I advocate that with my clients where I'm like, I always tell my therapy clients, like literally I'm just like, just incorporate movement, any kind of movement, yeah. not because I'm like, you know, trying to turn everybody into like Sarah Connor from the Terminator series. <laughs> like, I'm like, that is not where we're going with this. I'm like, <laughs> and like realizing that like movement and eating healthy are good for you independent of weight loss is like literally the most powerful thing in the world. Like I really bought into all of the mythology that like I would be happier and healthier if I was thinner. And like now like listening to the podcast, like, I mean, it's crazy because like I do, I have to acknowledge I have a lot of thin privilege. Like even when some like feeling insecure does not equal not having thin privilege. Like I definitely right. have it. Um, but it made me realize like every time I've ever tried to eat healthy or exercise, no matter what I told myself at a subconscious level, it was 100% in the pursuit of weight loss. Right. And it was because of an arbitrary thing that I'd gotten in my mind about like how much I wanted to weigh that had nothing to do with like my health or like what my body might naturally want to sit at. Right. And like now I'm like, I don't, I mean, I haven't weighed myself in a really long time, but like, I don't, I just don't check anything. The only metrics that I check are like, I make sure I get my blood drawn. Like I have, I don't have a vitamin deficiency. Right. I'm like, is my blood pressure okay? Do I have all the vitamins? Do I have all the little crystals that I need? Okay. Exactly. It's fine. And like, yeah, just that knowledge has been very liberating. Cause like, I now no longer have to worry about like, oh my God, I've been running for a month and I don't like, I don't need new genes. Like, am I doing it right? It's like, no, if you're moving, it's working. There's yes. If you're eating healthy and you're moving, you're already, it's already working and you already don't, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Like when I feel like, oh, my like quads hurt a little bit from running. Like, oh, I'm like a little sore. I'm a little tired. It's like, I did something like that. Mm -hmm. That I did something good for me. Like I took care of me and little me inside. Like, oh. like that's so special and valuable to have that sense of accomplishment, especially when you're struggling with depression. Like I had a really, really bad depressive episode in the summer of 2020. Like no, yeah. no surprises there. <laughs> yeah. I was um, like, oof, I'm sorry, but also yes. <laughs> but, um, and like the, biggest the two things that I did to like kind of pull myself out of it was I hadn't been driving for a while because it, driving had been causing me anxiety for the previous few years um so I decided to get back behind the wheel and I decided to go vegetarian and I was like I just need to do two things that are going to make me feel like I'm in control again yeah. and both of those things were so effective at like making me feel better and it was they were ultimately I think instrumental in in speeding up the pace at which I was able to get out of the depressive episode because like all I wanted was like a sense of feeling like I was doing something right. I didn't feel like I was doing anything, let alone doing something right. Oh, the knowledge that like, oh I taught, like I got myself back behind the wheel of a car. Like I'm not harming any animals in my diet anymore. Like that feels good. That feels really yes. good when you feel bad about yourself. Yes. And it's like, it's kind of the difference of like being versus doing. I don't know how else to frame it, but it's like that you're like, oh, I'm just being a person in the way that actually makes me feel really good. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's going to look, I realize it's going to look different for everyone. And for some people, like those, the, those changes, like the changes that I make are not changes that are realistic for them or that will be meaningful for them. But I think everyone has at least one or two things in their life that they're like, oh man, like if I like made this shift, it would make me feel a little, just a little bit, just 5% better or 10% better. And it's like, when you really commit to making that change, however small it is, you will just notice over time the accumulated benefits of it. Yes. It kind of has like, <laughs> my brain was like a snowballer, like a Katamari. <laughs> like, <laughs> it just rolls through collecting yeah. objects. Um, like a friend of mine was going through really bad depression, bleh, really bad depressive episode. There we go. Tried to merge those words. Didn't work. Um, and one of the things I said to her, I was like, look, I know this sounds silly. I said, but you experienced, you know, she went through a breakup and I was like, oh, you experienced it like in your home. I was just like, 
why don't you change the little things in your home? Not like you have to move to a different home, but I'm like, why don't you try getting like a new candle that you like, or, you know, like spray a different scent in your room or something like that. I was just like, why don't you do something like a little bit different? And like, at first she said to me, she's just like, Pam, I don't think that a candle is going to like cut it. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was just like, look, I'm not saying that a candle is going to like solve chronic depression. I was just like, that is not what I'm saying. <laughs> I was like, it's all about, but it really is all about like accumulating small things. Like yes. you can make like 15 small changes. Cause making the one big change that like moving to a new place, like that would really do something, but like, that's not realistic, but like right. getting a candle and like spending more time outside and like putting up like a new poster, like all of those things added together do start to accumulate good, goodwill over time. Exactly. Like once she came out of the depressive episode, she did, she laughed about it with me. She was just like, you know, I did get a new candle and, and you know great. what? It was really nice. <laughs> She was like, like, I was annoyed at how pleasant it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that is too funny. Um, I just looked at the time. I was just like, you've been so generous chatting this whole time. And I'm like, oh, God, I have to actually, like, go outside. Yeah, I'm getting texts and calls. But I told them, hey, I am talking about candles and the <laughs> I am Joan Didion. <laughs> I was going to say, we are like doing a Joan Didion, Eve Babbitt's combo yes. maneuver. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and that's honest, I can't stress enough exactly what I needed. Exactly what I needed. <gasps> that makes me so incredibly happy. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Why Not Both. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform. You can also come hang out with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, both on Instagram and on Twitter. This season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar magazine. Under the Radar is a nationally distributed print, music, and entertainment magazine and website. You can find them at www.undertheradarmag.com and feel free to support them on Patreon. Extra special thanks to our producer, Laura Studeris, who is literally a rock star. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you next episode. (laughs) 